Okay, we will call this uh, meeting the second ever meeting of the Sustainability and Resiliency Committee to order. Thank you all for attending. I'm John Strand, your chair. Let's do this, uh, and this will probably work as well for roll call, but let's just run around the table, introduce ourselves, and, uh, and then we'll go from there. I, to your left, are supposed to speak first, John? Okay. Go to the left. Tim Mahoney, Mayor of Fargo. I'm excited about the agenda today. I want to hear about our transportation system and what we're doing to help with this, as well as the sustainable vegetation. I think it'll be a great presentation today. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Brenda Derrick, and I'm the city engineer. Dave Leaker, executive director of Fargo Park District. Blake Mikesell, director of maintenance and operations, Fargo Public Schools. Bruce Grubb, city administrator, city of Fargo. Freda Graymig, public representative. Brock Morrison, facilities director, city of Fargo. Ben Dow, I'm the uh, Public Works Director with the City of Fargo. Nicole Crutchfield, Planning Director. Paul Mathis, Cass County Electric Cooperative. Jennifer Swetman, Public Res Representative. Diana Bauman, Principal Office Associate, Fargo City Commission. And we have, uh, if they could help us technically, we have Casey online. If you could introduce yourself, Casey. Hi, Casey Steele, uh, member at large. Great. And did we miss anybody? I think we've got covered our bases. Thank you all really sincerely. Uh, today's agenda is a good example of members suggesting topics for us to, to discuss. So, uh, you know, we've been hearing from a couple of you, and, and that'll be what will be reflected today in our agenda. Uh, and so, you know, going forward, that's really welcome. Uh, that we, we want to keep this alive and dynamic and keep listening and hearing. And, and the more you give us suggestions, the more we can put that out to the public. So, so uh, and we'll improve as time goes on. All right, we've had the roll call. Is that adequate, Diana, for the roll call? Okay, well, uh, is there a, a, a motion to approve the agenda or any changes on the agenda? We don't need a motion, but are there any changes? If not, if we're all okay with that, we'll proceed with the agenda uh, as, as it's in front of you. And again, I'll say this so you kind of know my, my leadership style, but you don't have to get my attention to, to speak. If you have something and we can get a dialogue going, by all means, participate. And, and of course, we don't want to talk over each other, but don't be so worried about the formalities that you have to say, Mr. Chair, may I address the chair, the table or the floor? You don't, let's just keep it alive and, and keep it fresh and, and, and have our all, give, give yourselves permission to, to, to engage uh, as, as you see fit. And if I need to rein the meeting in, I'll do that. Okay? That works for everybody? Yep. Is there any, are there any changes or modifications to the minutes of the last meeting? If not, they will stand as presented. And good, good work to our team for presenting that to us and for all of this packet, the presentation and the organizational structure to have a, a support team behind us uh, is really, really good to, to help us be effective. So Bruce, I'm going to let you introduce the topics that we have, number four first and then we'll go to number five. But if you could tell us where, a little bit about it, then we'll turn it over. To, um, to Julie first, after you kind of Thank you, and I, I know you just told me not to do this. I'm gonna do it anyway. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, anyway, at our first uh, meeting, a committee member asked some questions about our public transit system, and uh, we thought it might be a good agenda topic. And then, lo and behold, after the meeting, a different committee member sent an email and uh, that kind of confirmed that maybe it would be a good thing to get a, a presentation from public transit. So I reached out to Julie Baumelman, our transit director, and asked her if she could provide a presentation to us today, the SRC, on how public transit functions and uh, how it relates to our work here. And uh, she's provided that 
a hard copy of that presentation that's been three hole punched. You can keep it with you. Uh, but Julie, whenever you're ready, I'll turn it over to you, that lectern over there. That would be just great. And thank you for being here. While you're walking up, Julie, to the podium, uh, we really appreciate your b being the first ever outside presenter oh, thank at, you. Our, at our committee. So thank you for being willing to do that. Oh, happy to be here. Is it okay to take off the mask to talk here? Is that okay? Okay. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Again, thank you for having us here. I'm the Director of Public Transit for the City of Fargo, Julie Bommelman. You can just call me Julie, it's fine. And I'm gonna pull up our little presentation here. Okay, so when I was invited by Bruce to come here, I thought, well, let me do a little research on what this committee's about sustainability and resiliency. And I thought, how does that actually relate to us in public transit? So I tried to put together what I hope is a good relationship between transit and what you're looking for. With that having been said, I certainly can answer any questions when we finish with the presentation. So again, thank you for having us here. I have with me Jordan Smith. He's our fleet and facilities manager. So. Uh, he's willing to answer any questions as well. So let's go to the first one. What is sustainability? And it's not that I'm telling you this is exactly what it is, but at its core, it's a way to make our communities more livable and integrating and balancing economic, social, and environmental needs. And then moving on to resiliency, the best I could find that I thought was very appropriate was the ability to prepare and plan for, absorb, respond, recover from, and more successfully adapt to adverse events. So we'll start with sustainability. It's about the practices uh, that make good business sense, good environmental sense. For public transit, what does that mean? It means uh, three main things. Employing practices in design and capital construction such as using sustainable building materials, recycled materials, and solar or other renewable energy sources to make our facilities as green as possible. It also entails employing practices in our actual operations, so service on the street that we have. Uh, maintenance, as I was just saying with Jordan, is reducing hazardous waste. We want to increase fuel efficiency to the best of our ability and creating more effective and efficient lighting so that we have, uh, that is actually happening in our two facilities. I'll talk about that a little bit more about that. Uh, and then we want energy efficient propulsion systems, which are part of the buses. And lastly, it's employing community-based strategies to encourage land use and transit-oriented development and design to increase public transit ridership and usage. Now this particular slide, I did bring, I slipped it in after <laughs> I uh, sent the presentation to Bruce. I do have a copy for all of you, three hole punch. But I wanted to bring up the GTC, the Ground Transportation Center. We are in the middle of a renovation there. We did phase one, which was the interior of the facility last year. We are in the middle of phase two. We're gonna be kicking that off in May, and that will be the exterior of the facility. So. When we were designing and going through what it was that we were going to be having done down there, we wanted to make sure that we did the best we could to be good stewards of not only the taxpayer dollars, but any sustainability efforts that we could put forward at the time. So we will have LED lighting throughout the entire facility, which believe me will be a vast improvement. Uh, and then what the exterior canopies, if you're familiar with the facility, we're removing the one on the north side of the building. We're reconfiguring a little bit the other two sides of the building, so that, but we're gonna reuse the materials as we're going along and reconfiguring, so we're not being wasteful there. Uh, the new furniture that you'll be seeing outside is all done with uh, um, recycled wood. The restroom partitions are made of recyclable material and they themselves are 100% recyclable in the future. The stainless steel restroom accessories are made from 60% recycled material. 
And we have, and I don't know if everybody's familiar with this, but we have a poured quartz floor in our main public areas. And what that entails is uh, that it, it's basically almost like a granular sand type product that, that puts, gets put down on the floor and then you have an epoxy that goes over it. So it's extremely durable. And in this case, it's also lead compliant. So uh, anybody that's familiar with what lead compliance is, it's leadership in energy and environmental design. And it's a worldwide recognized standard. So it's, it's good that we could do that and, and have that. And the flooring is amazing. I, I love it. Uh, and the last thing we did or are doing is replacing the entire HVAC system, which is heating, ventilation, air conditioning. So we're updating those. Some of them are still original to the facility. So that, that's what we were doing at the GTC, at the Ground Transportation Center. At the Metro Transit Garage, which is the second facility owned by the city of Fargo that, that Transit has, it's out on 7th Avenue for those of you that are familiar with it. And out there we have some green uh, sustainability features that we incorporated into that when we went ahead and built that facility in 2009. Um, I'm sorry, 2007, pardon me. So when we're employing the practices again in capital construction, we thought, well, how can we be green out here? So what we did was we have a water reclamation system. So when the buses are being washed, the water is reclaimed and recycled for cleaning the vehicle so it kind of goes through this cycle and it does it a couple times and then of course we have to change the water at that point there's radiant floor heating throughout the entire garage area which is about fifty thousand square feet i think thereabouts so but that what's the advantage of that is that we have the buses pull in at any time of the year say it's snowing out they come in all that stuff melts off of them we expand and extend the life of the vehicles. And our technicians love it, so they don't have to lay on a cold concrete floor. So that's another advantage. We have air quality sensors. We have four different areas within the facility that uh, we have continual monitoring of carbon dioxide and nitrogen dioxide levels. And the air system, air handling system, will kick in automatically and make sure that the air is purified as it's needed along the, along the way. And then the roof structure is designed to support future active solar or photovoltaic collection systems, which there's not any talk of us doing that in the near future, but it is something that we could achieve. So sustainability with our operations. And I just wanted to cover, we are in the process of replacing all the lighting at the Metro Transit garage as well with LED lighting. And how uh, what's nice on that is it will pay for itself in two years. We'll, we'll recoup costs that quickly that the local share of the grant that I got uh, is going to repay itself within two years. So that is, that is a wonderful feature. Uh, we do have shelters throughout the city. I'm sure you've all seen them. Some of them have solar panels on the top, so it collects that and does the lighting at night, which is, I think, extremely beneficial for safety and security reasons for people that are out in the evening. And we did invest in eight uh, hybrid vehicles. So our first hybrid vehicle that we got was in 2012. And People ask, you know, what is a hybrid? What does that actually mean? It can mean a multitude of things. It can be compressed natural gas. It can be electric. It can be diesel electric, which is what happens to be our vehicles are diesel electric. And the way that it works is uh, very complicated to me, probably not to Jordan. But um, basically what happens is the, the electric part of it, the regen, uh, goes up to about 35 miles an hour and then the diesel part of the system kicks in and takes over. So uh, I had Jordan run some numbers with our fuel efficiency on the hybrids versus our regular diesel. And currently the snapshot in time, we're getting about 12% more fuel economy than we do with our diesel uh, buses that we have, which is the remainder of the fleet. And I just wanted to point out that 
the local economy benefits from this as well. There were 21 local companies that participated or contributed to building these hybrids. Parts, uh, you know, okay tire, but there were 21 of them that contributed. I think that's important when you're looking at local economies uh, around the city. Some, and the, in your presentation, there's a slide that shows a little bit more detail on how the hybrid technology works. Uh, again, it's a little bit above me as far as understanding the details, but it does do a nice job of demonstrating what, uh, what actually happens with the diesel system out there, diesel electric system, sorry. So I'm just gonna real quick, those of you that know Mike Williams have probably seen this particular graphic in the past, but uh, I wanted to do nationwide and then I'm gonna scope it down to what does it mean for Fargo. So public transportation it produces nearly 50% less carbon dioxide and nitrogen oxide per passenger mile. Uh, what's a passenger mile? You know, it's somebody gets in a vehicle, it could be a bus, it could be your own vehicle, it could be a light rail system car, and it's from origin to destination, and when you reach a mile, that's a passenger mile. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, locally, the hybrids that, that we were just talking about are equipped with uh, an Allison EP system, which gets us even better than the national average. Of uh, We get lower particulate emissions by 90% and lower uh, nitrogen oxide by 50%. And then if you're thinking about it and you're looking at this graphic, a single person, a single person using a bus can either take up those four blocks of traffic, those four blocks of cars, they can get on a bus, everybody fits on one bus, and this is talking 60 people, or they can ride their bicycles, which is actually, you know, bicycles, those are great. They're, they're smaller than a vehicle and they're not putting out any carbon dioxide or nitrogen oxide, any of that kind of stuff. So again, nationally, uh, some of these figures in here, and I honestly don't have to read all them to you, but I think it's important to understand that the people that do ride public transportation, and I, this is a good spot to, to say, there's usually three reasons somebody rides public transportation. They have to, they don't have a choice, they're transit dependent. It's a choice for them, then they just decide I'm gonna take public transit and leave my car at home, or it could be a combination. Someone with a vehicle that ride, you know, drives, say, three days a week, they take public transportation two days a week. It's, it's that dynamic. And I think it's important also to point out, and I know I get a lot of questions about um, people riding the bus and who are they. Well, the students here, the college students, make up 51% of our ridership. So that's the biggest group you're gonna see on board. The next biggest category are adult riders, so just, you know, your regular adults like all of us in this room. And then you have your people with disabilities, and then you have your seniors. Those are the, those are the main groups that usually ride our, our system. I think it's, it's interesting to understand that. Uh, again, just a few more uh, figures on the greenhouse, gra pardon me, greenhouse gas emissions uh, is something that public transportation uh, reduces. If we're using public transportation, we're reducing the fuel use on your average personal car. And that the, we're saving on the greenhouse gas emissions that contribute to climate change, and we want to pay attention to that. In transportation overall, so you're talking personal vehicles, buses, trains, it doesn't matter what they are, any type of transportation, is the leading source of greenhouse gas emissions, accounting for the second largest portion after electricity. Now, when you break that down, it's personal vehicles that contribute to 61% of that greenhouse gas effect. Transportation, buses alone, they contribute 1%. That's through, and this is nationwide, is from this statistic. And when you have a rail car, we don't have any light rail around here, but Generally, that's about a 2% contribution to it. So I think it's important to understand personal vehicles definitely contribute to what's going on in, in our society and in our you know uh, pollution contributions, climate change, all that that rolls together. 
And um, I'm just going to jump to the next one here. So locally, what do we do here locally? Well, annually, and sometimes this figure surprises people, we run 44 buses uh, any given day of the week, except for Saturdays and Sundays. And last year, I pulled the numbers for how many riders, how many miles, and how many hours. So we went 1.1 million miles last year with our vehicles. That's a lot of miles. And all of those miles that have people on the bus instead of out in traffic, where a lot of us are or a lot of you are, then that eliminates that vehicle or those vehicles. And it, it is an important contribution to recognize. Uh, and we also ran over 95,000 revenue hours. That's a lot of revenue hours. But all that rolls up together to create opportunities to contribute to the sustainability and resilience of this area here. And that's just, just locally. So uh, what did we provide for rides? Two million about. That's a lot of rides where people, and then we provided another 54,000 on our paratransit system which is the service for people with disabilities. And they ride those, you've seen them around, the, the vehicles that are, we call them cutaways. They're smaller than a large bus. But that's about 7,000 rides a day on average. That takes a lot off the road and gets a lot out of people's way for, um, for the transportation network. And uh, the third item that we we're talking about on sustainability is employing community-based strategies to encourage land use and transit-oriented development. And I recognize that maybe locally that's not an option, a TOD, Transit Oriented Development. There's a good example in Minneapolis, it's called Haywood 2. And when you go there, it's the metro system is the main uh, building when you first go up, but it's got apartments and uh, park and rides and everything built in and incorporated into it. So it's all one big transit oriented development. It's, it's really interesting to see that. Um, so there are a few more facts there. The one that I think is, is really interesting is for every dollar invested in public transportation, it generates from four to nine dollars in local economic activity. Well, you know, what does that actually mean? What is it? You know, what, how do we get that? Part of it is jobs that we're getting people to. You know, they're, they're getting to their place of employment. They're turning around spending that money in the, in the area, generally speaking. And when you look at that economic vitality, it's important for people to have that independence to go out, work, go to medical, go to school, whatever it is they do. But there is a ripple effect throughout, throughout the use of public transportation that sometimes gets overlooked a little bit. Uh, this is an example, just broken down a little bit, of the TOD I was talking about, transit-oriented development. It's just, uh, it shows you how a more compact, densified area is more conducive to having people, you have shorter trips where people are going, maybe they don't need to drive, it's walkable, uh, you can bike it, and you take a lot of the cars and vehicles off the road where if you're not and you're spread out, you've got that effect of adding more traffic to the transportation network, which we all know what that does. Some of our technology that we have on the buses that helps to increase our efficiencies, we have electronic fare boxes uh, which collect our fares and give us a lot of data that, that we utilize throughout the year. We have automatic vehicle locators, so we know where buses are at all times. Our dispatch monitors that. We have real-time data feeds, so if you go on your phone right now and pull up our app, it will, and you say, I wanna go to, you know, let's say West Acres, you punch that in, it'll tell you where the buses are, how fast you can get there, and uh, you can do it through Google Transit as well as just pulling it up in our app. It's, it's very easy to do. Part of what we have too are the green light signal priority. We worked with our engineering staff on that. Brenda, I'm not sure if you were here at the time, but um, what that does is it does not give us preemption authority. We're not like an emergency vehicle. But what it will do is allow us to trigger 
the emitter, which is on every bus that we have, has an emitter, and it will trigger it so that we can extend the green or shorten the red as we're approaching an intersection. So we can make our on time and, and keep moving as we want to and keep our schedules because people are counting on us to be where we said we'll be and when we said we'll be there. One innovation that I just can't tell you how wonderful this thing is. We're, Fargo was one of the first transit agencies in the country to get this. It's called a quantum. q Strength is a company that makes it. And what it is, is on every bus, we're required to have at least two wheelchair spots, or people with in-mobility devices need to be able to access public transportation and be able to be transported just as anyone else would. So these quantums, they're like a little pod. They come, the person will come on the bus, they back into this space, they push a button, and the arm automatically comes down, compresses against the scooter or whatever it is that the mobility device is, and uh, secures the person that way, and off they go. It takes about 25 seconds to do that versus two to three minutes for us doing it manually ourselves. So again, increasing efficiencies is, is extremely important. But it's amazing to see that thing work. Uh, one thing some of you may have heard of that uh, is a very good economy of scale is our UPASS program. All the colleges within uh, the metro area participate in this. But I brought this up because originally it was a CMAC grant, con just congestion mitigation air quality grant through North Dakota DOT. And what it was supposed to do is focus on the West Acres area as a circulator to help alleviate when there was a lot of reconstruction going on out there. It morphed into uh, a very successful UPASS program that started with NDSU. Um, but it, I think of how many students it's pulled off the streets and the roads, uh, and it's, it's quite significant. So I'm gonna move on to resiliency, and there's uh, four things that, that I was the most interested in and that, that came up that I thought would be interesting for the, for the group. So we want to understand where we fit, our agency context, where, where do we belong in this resiliency effort, um, and how do we assess the vulnerabilities and the risk that go with any type of, a, of an adverse event. You know, what's an adverse event, at least from our perspective? It can be anything like a natural disaster, like the floods that we get, the snow, the ice. Uh, it can be a financial crisis. You gotta plan for that kind of stuff. It could be terrorism. It could be safety and security. It could be any of that. You want to be able to address those. So moving forward, you wanna create uh, and articulate your vision, your goals, and be prepared when you do that. And then at the end of all of it, you want to be able to monitor your progress. Are we, are we you know, changing with the times, or are we stuck back in the 20th century? Sometimes we find ourselves a little bit stuck in the 20th century still. So for number one, again, um, we're just looking at enhancing our resiliency to allow better anticipation of these adverse events. How, you know, we know winter's coming. What do we do? What's our plan? Uh, you know, there's a blizzard coming. What do we do? Big rains, floods. What do we do? How do we prepare for that? You learn a lot as you go, believe me. And then you want to assess the vulnerabilities and the risks. So we want to be able to improve the system and its resiliency. So you want to frame it around the idea of everything to do with the domain of the transit agency. So policies, system planning, project development, capital programming, maintenance, and emergency preparedness. But make sure you identify opportunities as well, not just the barriers, so that you can keep up and, and uh, again, stick with the times. Change is inevitable, I, we need to move forward. It's, it's, uh, we need to embrace it as we go along. So. We want to have a plan. We want to be resilient to all those exterior pressures that we all experience every day for transit. You know, it, I can't tell you how many times a day there's a decision that has to do with something like this. And then monitor your progress uh, so you can measure for success. 
there's a lot of metrics out there. We use a lot of them. We report a lot of them to the state and the federal government. And that helps translate to our funding, which is very important. So you want to have your key performance indicators and your metrics in place. And you want to make sure that, that you're shooting for that success. And with that, I'm closing my presentation. And happy to answer any questions. I'm not sure what the protocol is on any of that. So one thing I, I haven't heard a lot about, but I'm interested in hearing more is your tap ride system. Um, that was something that uh, was introduced, what, about two years ago with tap ride? Yeah. And is it still going on? And has it, has it worked out? Or I just yeah. can no, hear good more? Because I, I know there's some benefits to reducing the amount of vehicle, the size of vehicle on the road and stuff yes, like that. Yes, very good. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, what Ben's talking about is our tap ride service. That's what we call it. It serves the industrial park area, which is an area where if you put a fixed route, which is a bus on the same street, same time, every single day, this tap ride, it's an on-demand service. So the people call for a ride. It gets punched into our software. Our driver's already out there. They go get picked up. They get taken out to the industrial park to their location. And it, it's been very successful. And we did add another tap ride vehicle to the NDSU area up there, and that has been very successful. That was to help address some of the evening concerns with the students going out into uh, some of the far-reaching apartments and stuff around the campus. So yeah, thank you, Ben. I was wondering, Speaking of resiliency, how was the transit system impacted by the pandemic? That's a good question. Uh, what we've had, as far as an impact goes, is that, uh, you know, we went, I don't know if you know, we went fare free last March, and we actually continued it for a year. We wanted to help people not have to pay for their rides and be able to get on and go wherever we go. Uh, throughout the system, but it has shifted a little bit. We, we're, we require the masks on board the vehicles. Our drivers also wear the masks. We've installed barriers so that the drivers are uh, a little bit more enclosed and protected from some of those airborne um, particles that are out there. They, we upgraded the airflow system. There was a, a technically, what is that, Jordan? air purification system, thank you, that helps uh, filter through a lot of the, the um, particulates that are out there. So, um, and we, we put hand sanitizer dispensers, you know, you see them in the hospitals and doctor's offices. We put the, two of those on every bus, so people had access to that. So we, we stepped up as, as best we could to do that, and hopefully some people saw some benefit to, to that and benefited uh, from being fare free for a year. So, did that answer your question? Sure. As a follow up, how did your ridership change or did it? It Yes, it did change. It went down. Uh, I think it was 31% is what, yeah, is what we, it did go down. It's starting to climb back up a little bit now that well, I think part of that is the weather's getting, well, except for today, the weather's getting nicer and people can get out, move around. And so, yes, it did impact our ridership. People were working from home. They didn't need to go places, so. Right, I think I, I was asking the questions because I've been wondering about how the pandemic and maybe future pandemics, um, mm -hmm. you know, that there's a, a, some thought that this may be the new normal and how we might shift to um, change to make people more comfortable riding the transit yeah. uh, in the future. What do you what do you think about that? Well, I think that we've learned a lot from this pandemic, and we're in the process of adding what we've learned and how do we move forward with what we've learned uh, to all of our emergency plans and our um, safety and security. We report everything to, again, the federal government. So maybe that hones us in a little bit more on what needs to be done. But I feel like we're ready for any pandemic type 
situation that we've had with COVID-19. Uh, you know, nobody was expecting that. We learned as we went. Uh, but we definitely took lessons away from that that we can apply to future events. Thanks, Julie. Uh, a couple of questions, only because I know I work with you on a close <laughs> close basis that might be interesting for the group. Sure. Um, one was, um, I think the group might want to learn a little bit about uh, some of the activities you're working on um, to get that uh, choice writer. Oh, right, yeah. And then the other question I had is, uh, it might be interesting for the group to hear how you're funded. I'm sorry, the last part? How you're funded. Oh, sure, yeah. Well, we'll start with uh, attracting the choice riders. There's, there's always been effort to do that ever since I've been here, and I've been here 23 years. So we, it's, it's morphed over time, again, learning as we go. But we do a lot of outreach with social media. We have the Facebook presence. We have tried to make it as simple as possible for people to get access to our information and hopefully at least give us a try. Uh, we have events throughout the year where we will, for example, with Earth Day coming up, it's get your can on the bus. You can ride for one aluminum can, just bring it on. We collect those cans and then we donate it to Habitat for Humanity. Um, so throughout the year, we do have, like I said, several events that, help, that we try and attract people. When the colleges are starting up, we go and we're at all the orientations. And I realize they're the students, but, but they are adults too, you know. So um, we do a lot of outreach with that particular thing. And, and we've had different promotions over the years. One of them was the, uh, the zoo. We, um, they named their little red panda, uh, who Maddie, after Matt Bus. So we had a nice relationship there. It was it was a lot of fun, and um, we got to see the panda when nobody else got to see it. No, yeah, I mean some of those side effects that you get. But um, so that those are the kinds of efforts we're making with that. And then as far as our funding works, what we get from the federal government is we have operating funding, which is a 50% uh, local match to their 50%. So if, if, they're, if we're getting you know, $100 from the federal government, we're getting 50 of it, or I'm sorry, we're getting half of that from the federal government and half from the city of Fargo. So that comes out of the enterprise fund. It used to be general fund, but now it's enterprise fund. And then as far as capital goes, that is 80% federal and 20% uh, local match. And what and we plan all that out. It's not like I walk into the, you know, the budget team and say, hey, I need 10 new buses. That's all got to be in, projected in your capital plan and it has to go through all the approval processes through MetroCog and the state and the federal government. Um, but that is how we're funded is 50-50 and 80-20. Anybody else at all? Bruce. Julie, at the risk of putting you on the spot, I don't want you to go away without a question that you might not be able to handle, but uh, Commissioner Strand and I were, were uh, uh, talking about the meeting earlier today and we were talking about you know, where do you see the future of transit going? I mean, we know autonomy's out there, it's coming. I mean, size of vehicles, how they move around. What, what's, what are you seeing out there in the industry and what do you kind of sense about where it's going? Well, I, frankly, I, my sense is that we're going to, going to see many more agencies moving towards some type of hybrid technology. So. Electric seems to be, CNG for compressed natural gas for a while was prevalent in the industry. Now we're seeing electric vehicles uh, taking the lead on that. So I, I think we'll see a trend towards that type of technology and, and move away from more fossil fuels if possible. And then I think what we'll see is, uh, again, the efforts to, to gain the choice rider is what we call them within the industry. But um, those efforts, I've, what I see here us doing locally with trying to reach out and change, make a few really positive changes is to, 
frankly do more stuff like this and get out and talk to the public more. We hold, like I said, we hold a lot of events throughout the year, but are we reaching everybody we possibly could? No, I'm sure we're not. So I see outreach uh, being something that in the future there would be more of. And uh, you know, you, attending personal events and getting out and talking to people, that word of mouth, it's, it's a lot. Uh, and so when you see these people riding, I think you have people that want to ride, but it might not work for them. So I think we'll see more on-demand service like the tap ride. And um, that seems to have been very well received. I think one concept that people struggle with, and it, it's something I hear a lot, is uh, kind of like Field of Dreams. If you build it, transit will come. It doesn't work like that. We have a very challenging time because we have limited resources. We allocate them and we plan ahead for them. And a sudden shift or a dynamic that comes along is, is difficult to adjust to. That's where I think we'll see more of that on demand working for us. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Sure, no problem. I was kind of leading you toward that on-demand thing. Yeah, yeah. It, it's earlier, just so. really taken off. It's a good service. Anybody can, else? Can you get the city administrator to budget all of these requests? <laughs> <laughs> He's a good steward of the money, so I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Feel free to join Anybody in. Yes. Hi, Julie. This is Casey, the virtual participant. Oh, hi, Casey. <laughs> <laughs> hi. Um, I was wondering, has ridership prior to the pandemic, um, oh, thing covered. Um, has ridership prior to the pandemic gone up as our population in the area has increased? Uh, yes, to, to put it in summary word, yes, we were seeing uh, gradual increases every year uh, with our transit efforts. So. It was kind of disappointing when, when everything came along. Of course, it's disappointing, I mean, to a lot of people. But uh, that we took a pretty hard hit on that. But yes, we had seen it ticking upward uh, every year. Well, that's All good right. to hear. Um, in, oh, sorry, one last, I had a follow-up question. Sure. <laughs> um, in regards to the growth of our area as we grow south and west more, our mm -hmm. routes extended or expanded constantly to kind of feed into those new neighborhoods? Well, it, it's, it's interesting you ask that question. Now we're in the middle of our five, we do a five-year transit development plan. So we bring a consultant on board and somebody from outside the area that they take a look at the existing system and the growth patterns and, and everything going on in the area. And then they come up with suggestions on what they think are future expansions. And the South and the West are two areas that definitely uh, would be uh, the first to target when we are expanding. But yeah, yeah, we do. Gotcha, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, Casey, for, um, for joining in and don't hesitate getting our attention when you desire to. Mayor. See, hey, Julie, I know that when commissioners talked about uh, smaller buses and electric buses, mm -hmm. is that something you can see coming? I think he said in 10 years, they'll all be electric. Is that happening? It's 10 years might be a little bit soon. Um, Jordan, do you want to talk to that one? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I, if that's all right, everyone. Um, so yeah, electric vehicles. Um, it's definitely um, something that is very prevalent in the industry. Um, uh, Duluth, Minnesota currently has two fully electric Proterra buses. Um, my personal belief is that eventually the industry will be 100% electric, but we're not there yet. Um, the main thing that we struggle with in this area is our climate. Um, the batteries on the buses have to be a certain temperature in order for them to operate. And unfortunately, when it's 40 below outside, all the battery energy is used to basically heat themselves. So they get about 15 miles and the batteries are dead. So um, I think the technology will get there. You know, I think our battery technology increases um, all the time, is getting better all the time. Um, so we will get there 10 years, maybe 15, 20 is probably more realistic. Um, but uh, it is definitely something that, uh, that we look into. It's something that we're planning for, um, for the future as we build infrastructure now. 
Um, so it will be a part of our, our uh, system eventually. Does that answer your question, Mayor? Well, I hope it answered yours, John, because you're the one who told me that was going to happen. But the other thing, in Europe, they seem to have smaller buses sometimes. Do we ever consider that a smaller footprint on the environment? Um, yeah, so like Julie talked about the tap ride, uh, we utilize a lot smaller vehicles in the tap ride. Those are usually like 11 or 12 passenger bus versus our 35, 40 passenger buses that run on the streets for fixed route. Um, so as we move more towards that tap ride, service um, as the city expands you know we would use smaller vehicles um, again less maintenance costs on a smaller vehicle less capital costs on a smaller vehicle usually better fuel economy um, stuff like that so um, as we expand and use services such as tap right i would anticipate that we would have um, a fleet that would have smaller vehicles yes a question i'm curious about is integration with other government subdivisions. Like for example, we, we have uh, the school district here. And in the school district, if I recall back years ago, had over $4 million a year in, that they spend in their transit program. And then they're buying buses and buying equipment. Then the city and our, we're combined with the multi jurisdictions. Is there ever a conversation about how they intersect and how we can step up uh, service and efficiencies across government subdivision jurisdictions? You know, the um, Commissioner Strand, what, the first part of those discussions started with the 09 flood, and we had the school district bring over uh, quite a few of their buses, and we were, well, at peak we had 33 buses running out of First Assembly. We learned a lot through that experience that they operate completely differently than we do and they have different rules and regulations and the federal funding that we receive it's actually one of their rules that we cannot do any school bus or tripper service uh, that would be us uh, as the public transit entity uh, competing with private sector so are there is there room for efficiencies yeah i think there probably is uh, would we be able to substitute our service for theirs or vice versa probably not we want to make sure we we are good stewards with our taxpayer money did that help absolutely okay yes Maybe. do you guys still use biodiesel didn't you have some biodiesel biodiesel buses we use the fuel biodiesel. I'm going to let Jordan answer that one because we've stepped away from that a little bit. Um, yes, we no longer, at this moment, we're not using any type of biodiesel. Um, we had used some in the past, and from this was before my time, from my understanding, um, it was causing issues with the fuel systems in the vehicles. Um, so we discontinued the use of any biodiesel and haven't gone back to using any at this time. Yeah. Anybody else? Greta, does this, uh, I think you had to advance this topic to the committee. Um, thank you for doing that. Does it, uh, have you, all your questions been answered? You may not have an answer to this, but do you have a figure for the cost per passenger mile for uh, the system? We do. Um, it, it comes out in our federal report every year. I honestly don't know it off the top of my head, but we do have that information. We have it per mile and per revenue hour, uh, and we have it broken down by route. Some routes it costs more uh, to to have the service there, so it it's a we have a cost per mile for every route. But I can certainly provide that to this group in the future. I yeah, I I just don't have it off the top of my head. I'm sorry. Do you know how it compares to? A metro area like Minneapolis, as far as our cost per yeah, mile and your cost, cost per, per passenger mile, it's pretty comparable to what their just their regular transit on the street. You know, not looking at anything else, it's pretty comparable to what they have. Yes, Julie, I'm just curious. I I, I often use the phrase referring to a magic wand. If you could do anything you wanted to to transit, 
to the whole paradigm of the services that are provided, what are some of the things you would think we'd, you'd do? Excellent question. You know, you, for 23 years, I've always thought, let's go fare free. You know, we tried that out and it was successful in a lot of ways. And we ran, but we did run into some issues with uh, it going fare free. So was it a benefit? Would I still support it? Absolutely. I still think it's a really good service to provide for the general public. Get on anywhere you want, get on any time you want, and don't worry about paying the fare. So that would be one of my long-term magic requests. And actually, another one would be to have us go to the electric buses. I think even though they haven't perfected the performance in our climate, I think they will. It's, it's only a matter of time, and I'd like to see that happen. Uh, boy, that is an excellent question. Uh, I can't think of anything else off the top of my head. I know it's there. I just can't <laughs> articulate it. I'm sorry. Don't you remember that one thing you wanted is an electric bus that was a circulator downtown so people could get on and off the summertime? I think you had that idea one time. We, we did, yes. And we, it wasn't electric, but we did incorporate that, the Link FM. And, you know, during events like the street fair, that was the most popular thing there. I mean, we, we could barely transport everybody that was getting on that. And I don't think people utilized it the way it, we intended it to be utilized. It was unfortunate, but it was to connect the two downtowns, you know. And I think we were ahead of our time on that one a little bit. Really great presentation. Is there anybody who has any final comments or discussion for Julie and 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 the, her team? Jordan, anybody? Um, Greta, thank you for bringing this topic topic up. Julie, thank you for presenting to yeah, us. Did you present you. create this all for us? Yes. It's 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 good to see us in the context of what you do. Yes. Now let's think about going both ways in life. Uh, when, when we have topics that connect to transit or when you have topics that connect to sustainability and resiliency, let's leverage each other's support and advocacy and, and, and visions so that we can get wherever we're going better and faster. Thank you. That would be great. Thank, uh, thank you very sincerely. You have a great team of people. All righty. Okay. Thank you. Any, nothing else for Julie while she's wrapping up? Okay. Um, Bruce, any of you want to go to the next topic? If Jennifer doesn't mind kind of a clunky introduction, I'd be proud to do that. Uh, this also came up at our first meeting. Uh, I recall Jennifer mentioning her research into uh, sustainable vegetation, which I found very interesting because obviously the city's involved with a lot of property acquisition, flood buyouts, uh, Main Avenue reconstruction, you name it. And um, so we oftentimes have to restore and establish vegetation on land. And uh, talking with our city engineer, uh, Brenda Derrick, about that a little bit, you know, maybe with some pointers, we could rethink a little bit about how we reestablish vegetation on city owned property. And I recall one point in my life, somebody told me that, hey, Bruce, your plants would be a whole lot healthier if you'd talk to them. And um, I found that out to be true, but it was a big blow to my self-confidence when somebody told me, that's just the carbon dioxide you're emitting. So this whole presentation I've been looking forward to since our last meeting. So Jennifer, thank you for agreeing to do this. And Jennifer just had her COVID shot just moments ago today. So we're glad you're able to be with us. And <laughs> technically, we should probably call you Dr. Sweatman, uh, if you're okay with our, our, our cordiality here. And if, if you like, you certainly don't have to. We oh. certainly appreciate you're here, that you're here. 
Yeah, and I'm excited to talk about this. Um, this whole presentation is about talking to plants. Um, or not really, but um, it would be nice if we could talk about that all day. Um, so basically, I wanted to kind of bring to the table um, this idea of promoting native plantings and um, focusing on kind of a more sustainable type of vegetation in order to promote what are called ecosystem services. Um, and just so that I don't err a little bit too on kind of like teaching an environmental science class, I've got a few definitions kind of scattered throughout for you guys, but um, ecosystem services are kind of defined as the goods and services that directly benefit people um, that are provided by the environment. So it can be anything from the actual uh, raw materials, like the lumber that you get from trees, to things like photosynthesis. So the absorption of carbon dioxide and the, the storage of that carbon and the emission of a waste product of oxygen, which is um, beneficial to us all. So um, some really interesting um, um, kind of topics kind of intertwined in here. Um, so just to give kind of a general outline, I'm going to talk about um, and give kind of an introduction to native prairie ecosystems because that's our main ecosystem type here in, in North Dakota. Um, and then we'll go into a little bit of management, um, but you can really get into some details there that I won't, uh, won't get into. I think that will be our next step. Um, and then a little bit about native landscaping and some of the benefits that we can get out of that um, kind of at the residential level and then also um, kind of across the city. And then some of the social benefits that come along with um, having access to green spaces. So um, this was brought up last month, I guess, by um, Mayor Mahoney with regard to the, um, the levies that are going to be created. Um, in association with a diversion project. So I'll be talking about that a little bit, um, but there's also the embankments as well. So both of these areas would be great um, or would be potential um, areas that would, would support kind of native vegetation. And the services that are provided by native vegetation can actually be really, really helpful in um, both of these types of habitats. I'll focus more on um, kind of the levees because it's a little bit uh, less complicated than what you would get with the embankments because of the, the flooding that would happen in those areas. So the structure of um, tall grass prairies, which is the specific type of prairie that is um, in this area, um, is the reason why it's so great for a lot of the, um, the things that we're going to be talking about. So it has this kind of complex above ground biomass structure. Um, so if you can see in this image, you know, you've got all these stems, you've got leaves, and that's really great for kind of increasing surface area, taking in more carbon dioxide, um, and then you've got this kind of, um, this really complex below ground structure. And with prairie ecosystems, the really cool thing and why I really liked this figure um, was that you can see in all of the grasses that are not highlighted or all of the plants that are not highlighted, you've got this really intense kind of net of roots underneath the ground. So the parts that we don't see, the parts that that aren't necessarily um, as attractive and as pretty uh, um, about this ecosystem are what's actually the most important. So this scale, which you cannot read, is in feet. It goes down to about 15 feet below the soil surface. So you're seeing plants that can reach down to the eight foot level um, regularly. Um, some like the compass plant or um, this blazing star, which is a tiny plant above ground, actually shoots roots down to the 15 foot level as well. So these roots play really, really important important roles in, um, in water purification. They can help to suck up any kind of nutrients that might be in the water, any kind of pollutants that might be in the water that we don't necessarily want in the water system. They can also help to stabilize that soil and prevent excess runoff of soil. It can help to, um, um, to sequester carbon or store carbon deep into the soil. So the list kind of goes on and on for the role that those roots can play. Um, and similarly with the above ground biomass, um, you've got carbon that's stored there as well, um, just not quite as much as you would get below ground. And just for reference, that yellow highlighted area in the center is Kentucky bluegrass. So this is what most of our lawns is, is kind of primarily consistent of. Um, very short above ground structure, very short below ground structure. So you're not getting much in terms of ecosystem services out of this, um, this type of grass that we're kind of planting everywhere. Um, in terms of carbon sequestration or carbon storage, 
Um, so we mentioned photosynthesis, uh, and just to give kind of a brief review, if it's been a couple years since, um, since we've kind of gone over the, the topics, it's where plants will take up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. They will use that carbon dioxide to produce sugars for their own physiological processes, but then they'll emit oxygen as a waste product. Um, you can actually visualize this in your prairie ecosystems. Uh, here in this picture, um, the dark black soil is that very rich organic matter. Um, and so there's a lot of carbon kind of stored in there, and it's a really great um, kind of strong soil, um, a very, very rich soil, and supports a lot of life. Um, next to it is um, soil that has been um, used in, um, it's been cultivated, so it's been used in agriculture for a, a bit. And you can see kind of the depletion of some of those, that organic matter beneath the surface. So um, grasslands contain all kinds of different species, grasses being um, kind of the, the big one, as you can imagine, being called a grassland. Um, but they also have shrubs, um, so small bushes, and some forbs. And forbs are the flowering species that we tend to, to see used quite a bit. Um, they play that really important role in capturing carbon uh, and burying that deep down into the ecosystem. In terms of kind of comparisons between other types of ecosystems, your tropical and subtropical forests are kind of your top notch in terms of capturing and storing carbon. The thing with, um, and, and then your, your tropical and subtropical grasslands are next in line, and it's hard to see these numbers, but this is in gigatons of carbon, and here it's about 550 gigatons of carbon a year by tropical, subtropical forests. Um, and then we're down here um, at 183, 184 gigatons. Um, Translation, a lot of carbon is being stored, um, but maybe not as much as your, your forested ecosystems. That being said, your forested ecosystems store most of that carbon above ground, whereas in your prairie ecosystems, it's below ground. And that actually provides an advantage um, you know, going into kind of um, a, a future where wildfires are more persistent and maybe a little bit more um, intense. With increasing prevalence of wildfires, um, you're going to see more of those trees burning in, um, say, California, which is on fire every summer. Um, we've had some, some relatively close fires recently. Um, all of those fires are going to be releasing carbon dioxide, but it's going to be, or releasing carbon, but it's going to be um, stronger in areas where that carbon is stored above ground. In your prairie ecosystems where it's stored below ground, they're a bit more resilient to that. Um, and so we're a forest that is burning will actually go from a carbon source where that, or a carbon sink where that carbon is being stored, it's turned into a carbon source where that carbon is then released back into the atmosphere. So not necessarily a good thing. You'd see the same kind of response in a prairie, but not to the same magnitude. And most of that carbon that is stored will remain stored. Um, so kind of a benefit there. Plus, it's our native ecosystem, so it's more resilient to changes in the climate. It's more resilient to droughts um, and things that we would expect to see moving forward. Um, so tall grass prairies also support a lot of biodiversity. Um, I mentioned the types of flowering plants that are found in a tall grass prairie ecosystem. Of the vegetation that's there, you get about 80% grasses, 20% forbs. There are trees and more shrubs and uh, succulents and things like that, but these are the dominant two kind of major groups. Um, and there are hundreds, five or 600 different species of grasses alone that can be supported by this ecosystem. Um, so it's a, a really, um, really diverse area. This kind of intense you know, foundation that's created by these plant species can really support a lot of, of wildlife as well. So for mammals, you get a lot of kind of your iconic species, um, your charismatic megafauna, if you will, where um, you'll have something like deer or foxes, um, different burrowing species that can also help to kind of aerate the soil, um, ground squirrels and things like that. Um, and snakes and amphibians, if you're interested in um, herpetiles, then those guys are, are also found in these areas. Um, another important connection to grasslands are through birds and what birds are um, kind of living in these areas. Um, and I found an interesting statistic, 330 of the 435 birds that breed in North America um, do so in grasslands. So um, even though it's a system that is on the decline, it still supports a lot of bird life, um, which has kind of really broad implications. Um, so some birds require this kind of habitat in order to survive, um, and if they don't have that, then we're looking at a pretty um, stark decline in them as well. 
Insects are probably, or are the, the smallest and most numerous of the animal uh, life that can be found in, um, in your prairie ecosystems. And this includes your important and, and sometimes iconic um, pollinator species like butterflies and bees, uh, wasps and, um, and others. So um, similar to the different birds um, that require these habitats, there are um, different types of plants within these habitats that some insects uh, require. One good example and kind of a classic example is a monarch butterfly. They love their milkweed um, and it's really uh, important that they have access to that. And that's one of the, the kind of um, more prevalent plants that you'll find on a prairie. So the current status of the tall grass prairie ecosystem across North America is not looking so great. Um, because of the rich soils, we started to kind of farm it very quickly because it supports crops and it feeds people. So there was this interesting balance in the early 1900s between um, growing food to feed and support our population and um, kind of mowing down these grasslands. And um, now we have about 4% of the total in North America remaining. Um, I've seen estimates as low as about 2% of that. And in this map, the light green is the historical tall grass prairie um, kind of range. And then the dark green is where there are actual um, remnant prairies. So these haven't been, um, haven't been um, converted to grassland or, or to cropland and are still in, in use as a prairie today. In the northern region, so in our general area, um, only about 2.5% of, um, of that tall grass prairie ecosystem remains. And you can see here that most of that is up in, um, in Canada and then probably more so in, um, in Minnesota than we have in North Dakota. Uh, in our defense, we only have a little sliver of tall grass prairie, so um, we're holding on to what we've got a little bit. Uh, in general, North Dakota has seen a 99.9% .9 decline in grasslands. Um, that kind of puts us on par with Iowa, which also has seen a 99.9% .9 decline. Um, and this, just to connect this to the impacts that it can have on wildlife, the grassland bird species, 720 million um, grassland birds have been lost since 1970s. And that's largely attributed to um, the loss of the ecosystem um, that supports them. And since uh, meadowlarks are so important in this area, 75% of meadowlarks have been lost um, since 1970 as well. And we're starting to see kind of an, an even more stark decline in their populations um, as a result of kind of the continued conversion of, of what is left of this ecosystem. So this is North Dakota. This just is just to show um, the prairies and where it does exist still here. Um, so we're talking specifically about the tall grass prairie um, on the far right hand side. Um, and the green dots or green spaces again are where you would see uh, remnant prairies and where that still exists. As you go further west into your kind of mixed grass prairies, you see more and more of, um, of that prairie that's still intact. Um, and then um, some kind of prairie-like areas within the badlands are also still intact. But again, we've lost a lot um, kind of on the, uh, the bigger picture, we've lost a lot. So all of this ties into um, kind of the economic benefits. Uh, in 1997, there was a, a study published in Science that um, where an economist took these ecosystem services, things that you know we understand a bit better, like raw materials and rec recreation, and converted that to kind of um, um, a cost. So how much are we willing to pay for those services? Um, it's much easier to do for raw materials. How much does lumber cost? How much does um, you know scuba diving cost or something like that? Um, but then they also expanded that onto things that are a little bit less, um, less obvious to us. So looking at things like nutrient cycling, capturing that carbon, emitting that oxygen, um, you know, what is that worth uh, in the bigger scheme of things? So they were able to do some calculations um, and put an economic value to tall grass prairie or to prairie and grassland ecosystems, um, not specific to tall grass prairies, but grasslands in general. Um, and while the data were kind of incomplete and are now, what, 20, 15 years old, um, they kind of came to an estimate of 200 $232 per hectare, or a hectare is 2.47 acres uh, per year. And that's the worth of the services that are provided by um, a, a grassland ecosystem. 
Um, for this particular study, the, the major drivers or the major things that contributed to that $232 cost was um, food production, and that's in, in terms of fishing, in terms of the game species that are supported by this. Um, biological control, um, which is also on that chart. Um, and that includes predators controlling prey so that there's not too much um, herbivory going on. They're not eating too much of the grasslands. Um, and then erosion control. I wrote pollution control on the slide, but that's incorrect. It's erosion control. Um, and that's the prevention and the loss of soil um, and um, either by wind or by washing off in runoff. So some really important services there. And the next couple of slides, I'm going to walk through um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Report from 2016 because it's got some really awesome um, information about um, the economics and you know how we can kind of um, apply that. And so in terms of ecotourism and wildlife watching, uh, wildlife watching, they call it in their report, 86 million Americans in 2016 were identified themselves as wildlife watchers. Um, that's 45.1 million, or 45.1 million of that group are bird watchers, interested in birds um, and, and watching birds. And with the connection of so many of our bird species to grasslands, um, that kind of supports the cause for increasing the amount of grasslands that we have. Um, a lot of those, so of the 86 million, 81.1 are um, folks like myself that hang around at their kitchen table watching bird feeders outside the window um, and paying attention to wildlife that's running around in their yard. And then you have 23.7 million that also go away from the home. And the numbers don't add up because um, some do both, so they've just contributed to both. <clears throat> So 27 or 23.7 million um, participants watched wildlife away from home. And this is an important number because there's a lot of money that goes along with this. Um, and so 17 million were following birds around, 8.7 million were looking for other things, whether it was birds or whether it was butterflies and reptiles. Um, those are the specific examples that that report uses. Um, but a lot of people are, are traveling away. And if you look at the pie chart in the upper right-hand side, um, these are residents that um, stayed in their state. Um, and then these are residents that only went to other states to go wildlife watching. Um, so here, we've got in-state, uh, stayed in their state of residence um, and went outside, and then um, those of us that stay here and don't leave. Um, so you're looking about 80% of 24 million people are staying relatively close to home to watch and appreciate wildlife. Um, if we kind of narrow it down to just our general area, and the Fish and Wildlife Report calls this the West North Central United States, um, you get about 10% of people in this general area that are going away from home to, um, to view wildlife. And that's about, if you take it you know, and narrow it down to Cass County, that's about 20,000 people. Um, so significant numbers there. Um, this figure shows the total amount of money that we're spending on wildlife watching. So you've got $75.9 billion that is being spent towards wildlife watching expenditures. Um, this direct kind of input to the economy. If we're buying from you know, local areas, then we're supporting the local economy. So um, $55.1 billion goes towards equipment. This includes things like magazines, binoculars. Um, it can be uh, hunting and fishing related gear as well. Um, and then 11 0.6% goes towards um, travel-related expenses, whether it's food or um, airfare, lodging, things like that. So the report also breaks it down by, um, or, or also included the from 2011 to kind of show the progression. Um, the, the figure here is kind of the more important part where from 2006 to 2011, we didn't see much of a change in the amount of money that was being spent on these wildlife watching uh, adventures. But from there to 2016, we saw um, a very huge increase. And I don't know what it was that happened between 2011 and 2016 that got people outside. But about $76 million, uh, billion dollars were being spent, billion with a B, were being spent on wildlife watching um, adventures um, 
alone. So that's pretty significant. And that, in terms of the number of people that were participating, was a 20% increase from 2011. So it was a significant increase there. Um, a lot of those, most of those are at home um, at 18% increase. Um, and then you've got, um, you know, away from home at a little bit less. So we're seeing more people still, but not quite significantly more, um, that are going away from home. And they're spending on average about 15 days away from, um, from the house. Excuse me, wildlife watching. So I'd suspect with 2020, with more people, there are reports of more people getting outside in 2020 since we were trapped at home and desperately needed something to do. You've got more people that were watching bird feeders. You've got more people that were, were getting out and experiencing and being a part of uh, the outdoors. Um, so I'd expect to see some of these numbers um, kind of increase in their next report um, that hopefully will be out in the next year or so. So we've got some local examples of um, some prairie restorations or prairie reconstructions is what they technically are um, in our local area that are really, really important um, and significant. So um, a project like planting the diversion, for example, is going to be um, what's called a reconstruction. So you've got an area that's been very, very heavily impacted by people, um, and that is going to um, require a lot of, of, of management practices um, in order to kind of make it um, something that can support a prairie again. So we'll plant native seed mixture um, composed of multiple prairie species in an area where that land has been very significantly um, disturbed. Um, this can also kind of count towards, I think, count towards um, you know, private properties if you're, you're kind of reconstructing a prairie on your private property or having a, a pocket prairie or a tiny prairie on your, your personal land um, you know, in town, for example, um, that would still be kind of a reconstruction. So a lot of examples in town that are really successful is, and my favorite one to talk about is the Urban Woods and Prairies Initiative um, that is a collaboration between the city of Fargo, the Fargo Park District, and Audubon, Dakota. And this is the, the buyback um, program that we were talking about, um, that Bruce was talking about a second ago. Basically, prairies were reconstructed in urban sites where the residences consistently flooded um, and we ran into issues with that. And so the homes were bought back, the structures um, for the most part were removed, and then the prairie was restored or reconstructed on those areas, or woodlands if that's, um, that's the ecosystem type there um, in particular. So these urban woods and prairie sites um, can be quite large. Um, the numbers are really small, but Oakport Prairie has 113 acres. Um, a lot of the other ones are, are um, you know, there's one as small, I think, as eight. Here's 6.3 acres, but then they're usually 20 to 30 to 40 or so acres. So these are, are pretty substantial chunks of land within an urban environment um, that have been reconstructed and rebuilt as um, native ecosystems. Um, in terms of wildlife watching and to connect it to some of the, the previous slides, this site in these images here, um, so this is Forest River. Um, it is this red dot down towards the bottom. This is Forest River Park. It's one of my favorite places to go. This is actually my son. He basically learned how to walk out here. Um, but it has a prairie and a wetland ecosystem. It has a woodland habitat. Um, so it's actually because of the diversity there and the, um, the level of restoration that's been done there, it supports a lot of bird life and is one of the most popular areas in um, the Fargo-Moorhead area for birding. Um, so it, let's see, 207 unique bird species were identified in this park last year. Um, and that's data from eBird, or have been um, identified in this park um, in general. And that's um, information from eBird. So birders will go in and they've got an app and they'll just mark that they've seen this bird. Um, Fargo uh, puts on um, Frostival every year during the winter months. Um, and they host a winter birding festival as part of that. Um, Two years ago, so in 2019, about 15 people attended the Winter Birding Festival. To their, in their defense, it was brutally cold that year. I didn't even go, so I, you know, the numbers might be artificially low, but we'll keep that in mind. Um, last year, about 40 people attended, um, and this year, about 70 people attended. So even if you throw out that really cold year, we're still kind of seeing an increase, and we're hoping that that trend um, kind of continues. Um, yeah, so this is one of my favorite sites. This is a fox. Um, there's a, an old kind of a, an old foundation out there 
where we found a fox den last summer. And so there were three or four fox kits that were kind of hanging around. We snuck up on them um, accidentally. And they kind of, this one stayed and hung out for a couple of cell phone photos. And then the rest of them kind of took off. But um, it's really cool to see that kind of, that level of, of um, organisms being supported in these areas that you know just a few years ago were residences. Um, at the more, the I think smaller scale and the more, um, residential scale, um, Cass County Soil Conservation District has been doing, um, has kind of initiated working with some um, local residents to plant small or pocket prairies on their property um, to do some native plantings and seedings on their property as well. So um, another way that that can be taken, that, that native prairie plantings can be taken into the city and increase that um, wildlife watching um, kind of aspect. So um, those were some successful local examples of things that have been done already. Um, there are also some local guidebooks that have been put together by folks that are associated with the Fish and Wildlife Service and NDSU on how to implement these, um, these management programs, how to plant a prairie, basically. Um, and so I won't go into the details of it by any means, but um, there's a local guidebook um, where that I think would be really helpful for um, kind of the, the reconstruction of the prairies around the, the diversion project itself. Um, and it's a six step process. Uh, the first would be setting your goals so that we don't waste our time um, and, and just kind of jump into things without fully understanding the ecosystems and, and determining what objectives we want to get out of this area. Um, but also site selection, which we kind of kind of got that figured out. Um, preparation of the site, so how do we prepare the soil for seed um, and things like that. Seeding, management, um, and then uh, management actions and then evaluation. Um, that doesn't mean that there aren't going to be challenges with managing these sites, um, which I'll get into. I totally tried to skip ahead of myself. Um, so you've got reconstruction of the prairie, but these are also great sites for outreach um, and education. Um, you could get school groups out to, to plant seeds, to plug, to collect and harvest seeds so that we can kind of keep the, the cycle going of, of regenerating our own prairies. Um, these are actually images from, this is my um, Ecosystems and Human Influence as an introductory environmental science class where I have a lot of students that are non-science majors that are taking this because they have to. Um, and they, they say that they take this class because they like the field trips. That's a direct quote, that's not my um, extrapolation. But they enjoy being out and learning about kind of the, the connections that we have to nature and learning about the complexities of nature that you don't necessarily see just kind of walking by. Um, so this is them kind of um, out there um, looking and understanding and observing. And here I have a, a group of um, incoming freshmen, so first semester freshmen that are taking a seminar with me where we talk about the impacts on, of humans on the environment in a non-scientific way. So just some general information for them to, to kind of increase their appreciation for and understanding of the environment and, and our role in it. Um, and here they're actually volunteering with Audubon Dakota to collect seed that they would then use in um, kind of maintaining some of these um, urban woods and prairies. So this is Forest River here on the left, um, and you can see the river in the back. And then this is Ponte's Prairie, and the river runs around, kind of around there. So um, hunting and fishing is also supported at these parks. Um, the Forest River has um, allows for bow hunting of turkeys in the area to help to control the turkey population. Um, we need to get more bow hunters out there if you've seen the turkeys running around town. Um, and then there's also um, an experimental conservation management program going out there with bow hunting of white-tailed deer because the population is getting uh, a bit excessive there as well. And there are other parks, um, Lemke Park, Lemke Conserv Conservatory, Conservancy Park. Um, they also um, have that experimental white-tailed deer management program going on as well. Um, so this is another connection to um, kind of the, the economic impact that this can have have. Um, hunting, if, if you're unaware, contributes, hunting and fishing contributes significantly to conservation dollars that are generated through an excise tax. Um, so an excise tax is charged for any equipment that goes towards the purchase of hunting and fishing licenses and, um, um, and gear. Um, so your firearms, your um, fishing rods, things like that. All of that money then goes to, or that excise tax money goes into conservation to further conservation efforts. 
Um, but some of the challenges that we'll see um, kind of moving forward with uh, reconstructing some of these prairies are going to be kind of the, the prevalence of invasive species coming in, um, where you're going to have, with kind of the early stages of, of planting, um, it's going to be pretty intensive management. So we're going to need a lot of, of management uh, in order to kind of mitigate the impact that those invasive species can have and promote the growth and establishment of the native grasses that we want. Um, and it'll probably um, require kind of a, a multi-step uh, approach as well. All right. Um, so bringing this into kind of the smaller scale, um, native plants as landscaping um, is a really important way to bring the um, kind of the natural ecosystem into your front or backyard. Um, it increases habitat that's available for pollinators. A lot of times these smaller prairies aren't necessarily the greatest for some species where they require a bigger or a completely undisturbed area. Um, but they do have a very important role in supporting pollinators in particular. Um, and they typically require less water and less maintenance. My ultimate goal is to have a mow-free front yard where I use native plants instead of um, you know, the grass that, um, the Kentucky bluegrass that I currently have in order to, to cut down on the need to mow but also to, um, to promote pollinators in my front yard. Um, and in that same U.S. Fish and Wildlife report, um, 15 million Americans are at-home wildlife watchers that call themselves at-home wildlife watchers actually maintain native prairie and um, or native plantings and natural areas within their, their yards. Um, so this is kind of an important way that we can bring this home. And this has been kind of facilitated in some areas. Um, Minnesota just had their Bees to Legumes program, which I think was a pilot last year or the year before, where they would pay people to, um, or, or subsidize the cost of native plants in order to promote the planting of more native species in, um, in yards. Um, and I skipped over one. Another role that native landscaping can play um, kind of at the citywide level is um, comes from some data that was in a, a Minnesota Department of Transportation report that came out relatively recently where native prairie ditches have actually been found to be um, really great at um, kind of holding more snow, which is important for our areas. So if we've got native prairie plantings in those ditches or in the medians, um, then that helps to kind of hold more snow, absorb more water as that snow melts um, than we would normally see um, with your standard kind of grass planting. You also don't have to mow it um, except for kind of the, the shoulders for safety reasons, but um, um, that helps to kind of minimize the amount of maintenance that's needed. Um, for people that are hesitant, skipping back to um, the at-home thing, for people that are hesitant about, you know, turning our, our lawn into uh, something that's a little bit more wild, um, there are all kinds of toolkits. A group of students put together the Pollinator Toolkit um, a few years ago, and it's been a project that's been kind of expanded on at Concordia for a while. Um, but this toolkit um, teaches people about pollinators, you know, starting from the very basic, what is a pollinator and why do I care sort of question. Um, it talks about their importance and the habitat that they need to survive. So it kind of targets in on some of the specific plant species, a lot of the specific plant species. Um, and then it also identifies locations where these native prairie kind of um, plantings exist around town. Like you can find a little pocket prairie at the Red River Zoo, um, and that's a great place to kind of go and see what it is, what it, what it looks like kind of on the smaller scale. Um, other resources within you know, this specific example include the, um, where you can go to buy native seeds. Um, if you're not quite sold yet on the, the native seeding, um, there are cultivars of native plants that are called nativars. Um, that don't necessarily or may not have the same um, or provide the same ecosystem services that others, that, that the actual natives do, um, but are selected for, you know, bigger buds or um, kind of longer bloom times than you would see in um, a wild type. Um, but it could be a nice balance between, you know, what we want, these big showy flowers for the entire summer versus, um, you know, what things look like in actuality. So a really cool um, um, kind of opportunity or, or toolkit there for um, helping to educate people and to help them make those first steps in planting. And there are social benefits to having access to green spaces. Um, there are tons of studies like this. I just pulled this one because it had kind of a big showy map. 
Um, the map and figures are of the relative risk of psychiatric disorders and the presence of green spaces as a child. So um, the researchers went through and looked at the um, the access to green spaces that people had in, during their childhood and then later on looked at the prevalence of, um, um, of these kind of psychi different psychiatric disorders. <clears throat> so this on the x-axis of all of these tiny little figures, um, I guess not so tiny, but, but here you're looking basically at the presence of green space. So two would be very little green space, 10 would be a whole lot. Um, and then the relative risk of psychiatric disorders is on your y-axis here. Uh, and, and so what we're seeing in all of these, and all of these correspond to different areas around Denmark um, specifically. So your purple are your, um, your capital center um, and then away the capital suburbs and you're getting away from that. And then you're getting into more kind of rural areas in the dark green. Um, the kind of takeaway from this is that the risk of psychological disorders goes up and they cite by 55% um, with children who were not, um, or with people who were not exposed to green spaces as children and didn't have that access to, to, um, to, ch to green spaces. Um, they, they kind of conclude that including green spaces in urban planning can actually improve the overall health and well being of the population of you know, a town, a city, a country. Um, and then they also um, state that reducing the, quote, rising global burden of psychiatric disorders. So this could have really broad reaching um, um, helpful impacts on our own health and well-being. Not to mention that access to green spaces um, also provides the different services that we talked about, taking carbon out of the atmosphere, um, increasing oxygen, so on and so forth. Uh, and this is a, a study that some of my students are currently working on um, that shows green spaces in green plotted um, on this map. So this is Fargo outlined in the dark black. Um, and then green are major green spaces. This here is mostly commercial, and that's why you don't see much uh, going on. Um, and so anywhere that is red is a five-minute walk um, or greater from a... Um, a green space. So these were defined as areas of concern by the students that are doing this. Um, so I think what this shows is there's um, a lot that can be done for um, some of these areas where we could could see an increase in the amount of plantings um, that or the the access to green spaces um, that we have. So um, kind of an interesting study that I wanted to point out. And then just to conclude, um, so the benefits of prairie ecosystems and of native plantings include enhanced ecosystem services, so we're seeing more carbon taken in, we're seeing soil being stabilized, um, and so on and so forth. Um, and I think one statistic I forgot to throw out that's super fun is that um, a, a prairie ecosystem can absorb up to eight inches of rainfall in, in a given time. So that's a lot of water that's not just flowing off and flooding streets and flooding you know, areas, um, it's being absorbed and utilized by that system. Um, they're less maintenance in the long term than having something that is more cultivated. Um, they can improve mental and physical health. So, um, so we've got ecological and social benefits that are very um, tightly intertwined there and, and economic benefits. So kind of your definition of sustainability is built into that. And then a fun <clears throat> report that I found, the 2030 Fargo Comprehensive Plan um, had a prioritization exercise where there were something like 40 or so um, different aspects about the city and city planning that, um, that citizens were asked to put their beans into whichever ones they found to be uh, the most important. And the top four are related to um, the environment and access to and um, you know, the development of green spaces. So we wanted to see an increased tree canopy. We want to see permanent flood protection, um, more and, and better access to parks, open spaces, and habitats, native habitats, um, and then a citywide trail loop. Um, so I thought that was particularly interesting as well and something that kind of ties into the topic of, of native plantings both in an area kind of outside of the city but also promoting um, an increase in native plantings within the city. And with that, I'll take any questions. I feel like I need to catch my breath. <laughs> you That's a both. really great presentation. Uh, Thank you. Really great. Who would like to, Mayor? Ben, are you starting to think of what you got to do now? 
Well, I think uh, we are doing a lot of these things as, as things are becoming available, especially with our flood buyouts. We're working through those last holdouts that will allow us to uh, move down into that river corridor and allow it to restore to natural habitat. Um, we're even this week, uh, over the next eight days, starting Monday, we're doing uh, tree planting. Our crews are planting about 1,400 trees over the next eight days, and that's boulevard trees. So those are all important things. And then we do uh, reforest the red. Um, we have a lot of sponsorship and help with that. that we go along the red every year and do major tree planting with the uh, many, many different uh, businesses and uh, charity organizations helping us do that every year. And so there's many things taking place. Um, some of the things that we do need to probably do a little better is some of the planting of uh, or restoration to the prairie grasslands. A lot of times we let it just move back on its own and grow and it's not the right species of grasses or plants that we need to, need to have in there. And uh, some of the things I've been reading over this um, last year is about pollinators. And uh, one of the things I've, I've read most of all is the significant de decrease in milkweed and, and their habitat is going away. And that's one of the number one issues that's causing our pollinators to disappear as well. So we have some nice uh, canvases that are developing across our city along our river corridor that we can probably do some of that stuff but we have to work hard to pick the right species to go in the right place because uh, one challenge we face with the river corridor is, is those noxious weeds. Canadian thistle is very common. And so as we do these projects, picking the right locations is important so we don't invest dollars into places that are gonna end up getting taken over by, by noxious weeds. So I, I think we're ripe for the picking, picking on this. And we've already worked on a lot of, you, you mentioned a lot of great projects that, that the city and park district has partnered with. And, and I think this is just a step forward. Go ahead, Greta. I have a question about the yard. So mm -hmm. say I want to turn my prairie into, or my yard into a prairie. Can I even do that in Fargo? As far as I understand, yes. I haven't seen anything that says no, and maybe someone knows they're going to. I think Nicole and I can both talk. There's a permit process that goes through our forestry division that allows you to do that within your front yard and, and, and in your rear yard. And so that's the process. We want to make sure that uh, you have the plan in place for it to be successful we, and, and so that the, the communication is with the property owner so that when they've gone astray, if that so happens, there's, there's the way to turn it back around and move forward. So yes, absolutely, you work with our city forester, Scott Ludo, and that has been declared in our city ordinance. And then to take that one step further, the uh, Cass Clay Food Initiative um, group out of um, public health, we're trying to do a blueprint, if you will, of all the different maybe um, kind of new concept, newer concepts like beekeeping, and native prairie food growing in the front yard boulevards things like that and so that a uh, resident would have a user guide if you will so whether they live in moorhead or fargo or west fargo they would understand those um those uh regulations if you will and we partner with the fargo public library as well as they do a lot of initiatives and education out in the community Great, because that was my next question. If you, if there was any means of providing support or education to people who might want to do these things, but they really don't have any idea how to do it, it could be kind of daunting. Yeah, I think with the public library and Fargo Parks, between those two, um, they do a lot of community outreach. Can there be more or more specific targeted? Uh, perhaps you know those those two organizations do it based on their own initiative. So has anyone done it? Are there examples that we can go see in town? One of, the, one of the great examples that's out there is Microsoft. Microsoft, in front of Microsoft, that's one of our largest permit holders as far as for a prairie restoration project that's gone place. But we have multiple other players within the city limits that have gone through the process and pulled permits. And then that also addresses, you know, if, if you get a health department complaint for, you know, letting your stuff grow over two and a half inches, then that, that addresses that and allows you to keep moving forward. So there is players out there do, taking part in this. On the other side of Nicole's stuff, I'm not sure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so Cass, um, the Soil Conservation District has uh, initiatives along with the river keepers 
where they do some targeted sites around. There's one in my neighborhood that I've been watching just out of curiosity. And, um, uh, and then we have uh, many projects that we do collaboratively, uh, the Fargo project. Um, and I know um, uh, parks, uh, I know there's been discussions along the way of, you know, we, as we get into vegetation management, it gets tricky. Uh, disturbance, as you mentioned, is the number one issue. Um, as you disturb and try to reestablish um, contextually, it's very difficult. And we all have stories between Forest River, Unicorn Park, Fargo Project, Ravanas, they all are different. And, um, and so I know we've been talking about how do we staff up in order to get experts on staff. Uh, we depend, I don't know, I can't speak for you, um, uh, Dave, but I know we depend a lot on Prairie Restoration. They're one stop shop, but they're very, getting very distributed. So we, there's a, um, again, talking about the larger uh, environment, uh, we could use more contractors, honestly, that know how to do this. Yeah, I, I know. Uh, not, uh, Out of it, society has been wonderful. I know they accepted one of the diff most difficult sites and are working forward to try and move forward that with that this next summer is is our old snow dump facility here right along the river corridor that snow had been hauled into for probably 60, 70 years, and they've accepted that challenge. And we've done some test plottings and, and stuff like that. So uh, that's a partnership that we're doing to help them try and restore that site. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead, Casey. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Greta, just on a residential small scale, last summer they did a pilot program for Boulevard Gardens, and I took part in that. So now I have a couple little Boulevard Gardens, um, mostly focused on pollinators, and I know a lot of folks are focusing on um, edible gardens for that. But I believe it was renewed and that we're still able to apply for those and with city guidance kind of get permits to build out uh, boulevard gardens, which is very exciting. Dave? Yeah, I was just gonna mention, you know, as Jennifer said, a lot of those sites along the river and, you know, then all the way into Unicorn Park for the, you know, the Woods to Prairie Initiative, we've been working with, you know, Audubon, Dakota and Sarah and Marshall over there and, you know, I think of, as they've grown their agency and their fundraising, they've helped us actually contract with Prairie Restoration. You know, we've had a lot of these demonstration sites over the past 10 years, and as you know, it takes three to five years to establish, and we've just never been able to fund that or find the expert to do it. So Audubon Dakota's done a great job of stepping up to where we can get some of these sites established. And, and a couple good ones we have working on, you know, is the old Barrow Pit site down south, I think it's Briarwood. Um, you know, that's been one, one side's been growing for several years. The last one got planted a year or two ago, so that's going to be a nice site. But up and down, you know, the river quarter, we have great sites. Um, out by the Shields Arena, Urban Plains, that one came in very well. And as we get more of these sites, we're actually talking with Audubon Dakota about, you know, maybe uh, co-oping a full-time employee just so we can have those experts on staff and, and be able to handle a lot of these prairies. Um, you know, on smaller site demonstration plots, we're actually incorpor incorporating these pollinator gardens into the neighborhood park. So, you know, while, there's, while we're trying to get more in town, you know, maybe kids can go to the neighborhood parks and kind of check, you know, it's maybe a little kidney bean shaped planting, but you kind of see, you know, some of the native plants and flowers and, and pol butterflies and bees out there. So, yeah, I mean, Audubon, Dakota is like, you know, they just increase the awareness and they've done such a good job of fundraising so they've really taken the ball and ran with it Jennifer I'm just curious when you look around the table here you have the city you have the parks and you have the schools um, I'm just curious if you had a policy recommendation that we could all take home and go, that's important, we, sh we really should aim toward that. Uh, what would you tell the city and the parks and the schools, this is what you need to do, start here, do some of this, I mean, I'm just curious what your roadmap for us would be. It's a huge question. Uh, gosh, um, roadmap or wish list? Both. Um, I think that, that starting with, um, you know, 
corridors around highways would be really important and really helpful. Um, and then bringing it into kind of closer into the city um, and, and seeing, even if we started small with things like Dave mentioned about, um, you know, bringing um, education gardens, pollinator gardens within, um, you know, like Island Park, for example, you've got this massive green space, um, but it's, it's largely unnatural. So bringing in kind of uh, some little areas that are natural with maybe a little sign that, that teaches people about that system and, and how it works and, and what it does and why it's important could be something that helps to, to promote that and, and get people more interested in seeing that in their yards. Yeah, it's a huge question. If well, anything else comes up, I'll, I'll get back to you. <laughs> what I'd be hoping for is that if anybody has action suggestions for us, th all, don't hesitate ever putting uh, those ideas forward because maybe one of these days we'll embrace one soon. And then we can report back, this is what we've done. You know, we've decided to do this and we've decided to implement it. And we've decided to go down this path. You know, so uh, it, couched in all of my thinking is what can we do? How can we do it? What, you know, it's not just the wish list, it's the roadmap of the first thing you do is this, and the next thing you do is this. Um, you know, but there's just, it's, my head's spinning after your presentation with, with thoughts about our environment and our culture. Uh, N N Nicole. Yeah, I was gonna say, Jennifer, thank you very much too for, um, I love your last slide on the benefits and the um, 2030 Fargo Comprehensive Plan. And Commissioner Strand, I think that that's the connection, right? Is So that Go 2030 plan, um, in terms of the planning department, we have that earmarked, if you will, for in probably two to five years for an update. And, and also, um, you know, we talk a lot about how do we um, update you all on what we're working on and you know a lot of these types of programs and like the programs Julie was talking about are really into the weeds of operations but the general public wants to know and then we have really um, you know kind of I, I'm not trying to be trite here really smart people in our organizations and in our universities that have you know a ton of interest and knowledge as well and so I know that's one of your goals is how do we connect that interest group, those interest groups with our day-to-day -day operations. A lot of that's done behind the scenes on, you know, we go to Riverkeeper meetings, we go to, um, you know, discussions on that. But when we're in our day-to-day -day operations, you know, it's, it's we're, we're just kind of, you know, nose to the grindstone trying to get it done. And so it's like, how do we build those communication networks? And um, I love the inclusion. I, I think the policy recommendation is how do we include ecosystem services into our financial, into our financial model, and into our finance model, into the ROI study that's getting ready to come forward. You know, so you know how do we include ecosystem services into the way we think? I I don't know. We tr the first our first go at it was with the diversion, uh, way back in 2009 as the core study, and that was a huge debate. Uh, I think that's a really fascinating comment because it takes me back to when I was studying economics and the professor would harp constantly that incentive, incentives matter. And so how do we get individual, I mean, we can action some things on via public works, but then there's also the private sector and you know businesses homeowners how do we create incentives for people to do something different because there's a lot of there's a lot of pushback against that so Greta, yeah i get calls every day on the fargo project <laughs> would that be like incentives like put a green roof on uh do your like a tax yard? break if you decided to convert your yard to a prairie that sort of thing to make it more valuable to people and also that's incorporating the value of that ecosystem service into your financial model it's really interesting ben so there there is some credit that can be applied to under your stormwater fees that we do collect for each e either a business or a residential owner i'm not the expert on that but i sat through the process and so as a residential person if you do decide to create your your yard into that there there's some options in there for not only how, how you deal with the stormwater reduction. 
phase. And, and businesses have that option too. So Jody Beertrand or City Engineering is kind of the go-to on that. But I, I think Jennifer nailed it where we, where we need to be first step is education. I mean, there's a lot of people that it, it, this, this prairie restoration and projects and stuff don't conform, right? And so when we don't conform and it looks different, it's weeds or it's not working how it's supposed to. And, and the education part is something that I know my group struggles with to the point of Veterans Boulevard has three roundabouts that are prairie restoration projects. And we've put signs up trying to educate people, make them bigger. Hopefully people can go and read and what's going on. And so we're trying efforts, but really we're not probably doing a job of pushing the education out of what's going on unless we're called into action about what's going on here, so. Well, and just, just to jump on what Ben's talking about education, pre-COVID we were just starting to think about how we we're gonna redesign Yonker Farm. Um, you know, we have the Children's Museum up there that um, you know, we're looking to maybe transition a uh, vet out there is, is about ready to retire. And what our thoughts were is how, do, how can we turn that 58 acres, I think it is, into like a conservation learning site. So actually just this past week, you know, from where we started about a year ago, we're going to reinvent this kind of kickoff meeting. And we've got several groups. We've got uh, River Keepers, Audubon, Dakota. Um, the Children's Museum, Northern Plains Botanical Society, North Dakota Game and Fish, NDSU, um, and try to put this whole out, indoor outdoor learning site, conservation, wildlife. And I guess kind of the grand plan, if I would say, is can we, can we build a facility together that has, you know, an educational piece, uh, kind of an indoor amphitheater, offices, places to store equipment, offices, or I already said offices, but, and then outside you have trail systems, native prairies, you know, if river keepers gets involved, basin watershed education, uh, Northern Plains Botanical, I mean, all kinds of things in this 58 acres, and it'd be kind of a destination site for North Fargo, which, you know, we always get criticized the park district, everything's going south, but this would bring something back to North Fargo, and it'd be a perfect type of an education site where it's almost, uh, yeah, I mean, you label plants, you label trees, you have trails. And so, I mean, that's one thing just, you know, hopefully we're going to get going here and, and get some momentum built up because it would be great. I know there's talk out there about a children's science museum and it'd be whether they would like to locate up there, but I think it would be a good opportunity for an indoor outdoor science museum. So, good dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Mira. Well, I just think it's good to uh, have a discussion on policy because you had some trees you had to cut down and people were not educated on how much thought goes into that and what has to happen in those regards. And it seems like sometimes we get a public pushback because they don't know our policy or know what we're trying to do. But I think you make an excellent suggestion, Commissioner Strand, that maybe we need to talk about the policy of what we're going to attempt to do as a committee at the city. And green is really popular right now president's trying to fund some of that so there may be some funding that we can find to help in some of this but I think it is time to do that because with the diversion I think we have 8,000 acres that we have to figure out what to do with and how to maintain it and what to do with it that could be an educational site as well you could have bike trails through that saying here's why we have this here's what's going on great presentation really enjoyed it and I know Governor <coughs> Burgum really likes the fact that the prairie grass goes so far down and can be utilized as all the things you talked about today so Really an education, John, just two great presentations today. Thank you. Anybody else with anything for Jennifer? You know, I, I have something in my mind, and I'm not sure. It's, it's way out there in orbit relative to our local focus, but, I, but it haunts me. And, when, and I'm not sure how many of you are from here, this region originally, but when I was a kid, in the, I was born in the mid-'50s, we saw a disappearance of the wildlife. We saw the birds disappear. We saw the wolverines disappear. We saw the porcupines disappear. We saw a complete disappearance. And people debated for decades what happened. You know, some thought it was radi radioactive fallout from testing down in, you know, in the, in the southern part of the country. And, and, and then later on, some people suggested it was DDT. You know, um, so all, in that context, and, Jen, and Greta, this gets into your arena, but you know, when I go home now, I'm inhaling Roundup, 
nonstop during certain seasons. And there must be some really bigger connections to some of our bigger actions to even at the local level. And, and, I, and I'm not sure how to phrase this, but, but we're, we're charged and compelled to, to act big and small. Do you have any just initial thoughts on us as a, how we go forward, not just for here and not just for the schools and us and our parks, or, but for the, the region? I think with something like the, the diversion project and what we choose to plant in this area is a way that we can um, kind of lead by example. This is a really great area to, um, you know, specifically to put a tall grass prairie ecosystem um, where you've got the, the services that are provided in soil stabilization. We don't have to worry about it kind of washing away. Um, so I think that in, in one sense, um, kind of leading by example on that project um, because, you know, as we know and you mentioned, the diversion project, you know, is kind of surrounded by quite a bit of controversy. So um, we have the opportunity to promote a native and dying ecosystem, um, bringing in kind of the positive aspects um, and, um, and using that to promote pollinators, which is a hot topic right now, uh, promote birds, um, and kind of continue on um, in that direction, I think, um, would be really great it, and our time is running short but like Ben's dealing a lot with pollinators and monarchs but that's a local example right now moment present of a topic that humanity does care mm -hmm. about uh, our impacts on other forms of life and there's no doubt about that we've gotten that pretty loud and clear <laughs> anything else for the good of the order thank you very sincerely and, and, and Julie, and, and thank you, Jordan. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, this, is, this is a really, really uh, good start today. Is there, I don't see anybody here for public comment from the public, but we welcome folks to join in. And at the end of the meeting, we'll always have a, a, a moment. If somebody wants to show up and, and share something with us, that's going to be part of every agenda going forward. We're going to keep meeting the second Tuesday of every month at 3 o'clock. So uh, uh, until further notice, that's our, our booked time. Um, anything I'm overlooking today? Okay. Suggestions for future topics? Do not hesitate letting Bruce know, and me, and us. Uh, ideas for presentations down the road, things that we can look at that will fit, because we're going we're gonna to keep uh, learning. Bruce, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, I'll let a couple of weeks go by, but I'll send everybody out just kind of a teaser for agenda items. If something strikes you over the next couple of weeks, always looking for agenda items. It was kind of a shot in the dark today, these two presentations, but I've never been prouder. So it's just great, just really great. So thank you. And thank you, Bruce. And one last thought is let's hold ourselves accountable and let's remind ourselves of these topics. And hopefully down the road, we'll be able to look back and say, we did something here. We took this discussion and we leveraged it into uh, constructive, positive, futuristic change. So, so don't, we, get, we can give ourselves permission to advance uh, topics and ideas and, 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 and actions and policies that will have a, an impact relative to the context of what we're what we're doing here at this table. Any final thoughts from anybody? Ben? Big thank you to Brock. He uh, brought a grant opportunity for some more lighting over on the Public Works campus. And we, we just recently got another $12,000 in grant funding for to change some lighting over our campus over there. So that's a good one there. Thanks, Brock. And we appreciate the partners who are at the table, the, you know, the electric companies, utility companies, the park district, the schools. We really value your uh, willingness to, to join in, in this conversation. Our next meeting will be May, May 11th here in this room. And on that note, we'll adjourn. Thanks, everyone, very much.